right, so excited to introduce our next guest, Will Rojas from Coactive AI. Hey, Will, how's it going? Hey, gang. Uh, is the audio okay, really? Yep, you look, uh, you're a little fuzzy, but your oh. audio is great. Okay, okay, awesome. All right, let me know if there's anything you can fix before we start. <laughs> I think you're good. All right, here are your slides. Looking forward to the talk. Awesome, thanks, Lily. So, Ooh. is it good? Yeah, yeah, I took you away by accident, which was not. Oh. All right, so, all good? Awesome, okay, it looks good from my end. So, hey, everyone. Uh, so, uh, just wanna introduce myself. My name is Will Gavidia Rojas, I'm one of the co-founders of Coactive AI. Today, I want to talk to you about essentially bringing structure to unstructured data. And really, what this talk is about is some of the lessons that we've learned in designing an AI first uh, system. So, I think part of the reason why we're all today is that really the nature of data is changing, right? Go back in time about 10 years ago, right? The way we thought about data was mostly from the tablet perspective, right? The table, a row. In this case, Chicken G's is one of my favorite restaurants. And so, you know, hey, I'm going to give it five stars, right? That's kind of what we were thinking about uh, sort of around the big data movement. But today, Unstructured data dominates a lot of the data that we see, right? And we're really moving away from data to content, such as a rich text description or a rich visual image of the actual delicious chicken sandwich that uh, you know I love to go to. And so this kind of goes back to uh, Bill Gates' quote of 1996 of around content being king. And really the, his main takeaway was that those that actually control the content are going to be the real winners in the internet revolution. And if content is a king, well, I would argue is that the king's already here, right? So 80% of worldwide data is actually expected to be unstructured by 2025. Nearly 80% of people say that a lot of this unstructured user-generated content impacts real decisions. And generative AI is expected to surpass what human workers can produce by 2030. So this is a massive explosion of just unstructured content being generated that we need to make sense of. And the key to all of this is actually AI, right? What are we talking about, uh, say, uh, sentiment analysis of a sentence, or we're talking about object detection with an image. AI is actually, you know, our little motto is if, if content is king, AI is a new queen, and AI is really going to be the key to unlocking a lot of this, the value from this content. The main thing that I want to talk about today is that marrying AI and data systems or doing AI at scale in particular is actually quite challenging. On the right here, you see kind of like what we generally see in most organizations where you have a lot of data being generated, a lot of its structure, a lot of its semi-structure, and that has a very clear path of how it gets consumed in traditional systems. But for unstructured data, it's it's kind of it's kind of a mixed bag, right? We generally see people archive it, store it, but then when they do afterwards, it's all over the place. Uh, there's folks that actually do nothing with the data because it's really difficult to, to tackle. See a lot of people throw human labeling at it. Some people do AI power APIs. I think one of the arguments that we want to make is that we want to move towards a world where we're actually thinking about not just AI as a one-off thing, but AI as a natural system that can be done at scale. And this is actually our main focus of what we've been doing at Coactive AI. We're building a reliable, scalable, and adaptable system. In particular, we do it for unstructured content in the visual domain. But what I really want to talk to, about, to you about today is some of the lessons that we learned in designing such a system for three plus years of user research and two plus years of building uh, this thing. And really three lessons, but the first one I want to just say to just kind of set the stage is that actually, despite all the AI hype, what we learn more and more as we talk to a lot of companies is that few companies do actually a little more than just archive their unstructured data. This, however, is changing very rapidly in AI, as the AI adoption is growing really fast, especially within the context of text. But we see that lagging in other modalities of data. Um, the two other lessons are going to be what this presentation really is about is essentially kind of walking through the main pitfalls that we see people do when they try to tackle unstructured data. One of them being that logical data models actually matter a lot more than you think. And a different way to look at embeddings, not necessarily as a semantic means of understanding, but as a way to actually cast compute and be cost effective and do an AI at scale. So that said, let's get started. So logical data models more than anything, but you know, I think probably a lot of people are wondering, like, well, what the hell is the data? This is a logical data model, right? So let me explain. So if you think of AI as this kind of monolith that generates metadata, right? You generally have the data stored in some sort of block store. It gets fed to some sort of foundation model that the AI team owns, and then the output of it gets stored somewhere else and it gets consumed by product folks, BI folks, et cetera, right? But what's missing here is that this handoff between the data folks or a data engineering team and the AI folks tends to be hugely important. Uh, in particular, the pitfall is to just think about, hey, just use what we stored, right? Because in the storage layer, the physical data model that we use is generally one of a key value source. Say it's a comment.json and then some value of text, right? But it turns out that these AI models are actually very finicky about how to think about the inputs, right? So 
uh, the inputs are data specific. So is it text? Is it audio? Is it image? Is it video? Right? And they also tend to be task specific, right? If it's text, am I doing sentiment analysis? Am I doing summarization? Am I doing some other task, right? And so essentially this combinatorics of data and task makes it such there's a large number of logical data models that are input. And what we generally see happen is that there's an impedance mismatch between the way it's stored and the way it gets consumed. And usually no one explicitly owns this. The data team ends up building a system that doesn't actually capture the needs of the, the AI team. And the AI team ends up building a bespoke system to kind of fix this impedance mismatch because you know someone has to do it. And overall, we find that the solution then is one such that ends up bottlenecking the entire AI pipeline. So uh, to kind of go a little bit over the hidden complexity here uh, is that in text, for example, let's say you stored it as a, again, a JSON file with some text about your review of this chicken sandwich that's awesome, right? And let's say your task is just summarization, right? In this case, there's no real impedance mismatch, right? You can just, there's no transform needed. You can just feed it to, a, to the summarization task. But if you have more complex tasks, like say, say a language detection, you might have to do something really simple, like a random selection of a sentence, or in, in say sentiment analysis, you might actually want to do something more complex, like a key phrase, key phrase extraction. But the main point here is that that physical data model is actually different from the logical data model, which is not just a key and some value, but there's actually some sort of pieces of metadata or even sub-sentences that are relevant here. This becomes more obvious as you go to multimodal approaches. We may have, say, a social media post that has a comment, a background, uh, image, right? Um, maybe a, maybe a, sorry, a background song, uh, a video, and an image, right? And if you send this to a multimodal model, the way you actually might want to think about it logically is almost as a post being a single entity that contains multiple of these modalities of data. And so the main takeaway here is that to order, in order to overcome this impedance mismatch, we really had to focus on actually building logical model, models at scale. Uh, in particular, when we see this works best is when folks realize that there's a mismatch here and we could create data plus AI hybrid teams that actually work in solving this AI mismatch. And what ends up happening is that not only do you resolve the AI bottleneck, but all of a sudden you have to realize all these pathways for optimization. To give an example, an image preprocessing, something where we saw this is there's an image, uh, you know, this chicken sandwich image, everyone's doing the same data transform pipeline to feed into a PyTorch model. And so you're doing the exact same IO on compute three times. But rather, if you, if you have actually the data folks and the, and the AI folks sit down and look at this, it becomes very obvious where there's room for optimization in which like, the AI folks can just consume that pre-computed, pre-transformed um, image and that's up overall leading to a lot of really awesome consequences such as, hey, you can use it, utilize your GPUs more effectively. So that's kind of lesson one. And lesson two, I want to just have a different view of embeddings, uh, particularly for the standpoint of cost effectiveness. So once you actually start doing a lot of this work, this is how it starts, right? You start just generally with one foundation model. And very quickly, what you see happening in our experience is that, hey, folks work with a foundation model for a specific task. Maybe that foundation model is really popular, so there's a second task. And one task turns into five, and all of a sudden, you have a lot of I.O., a lot of compute, and you know maybe your billing department comes and knocks on your door and tells you, hey, what's going on with this bill? And what ends up happening is that AI costs quickly grow out of control and bottlenecks future foundation model applications. And I think the pitfall here is that you really have to break up that monolith to understand what's happening. And uh, something that you can do and actually leverage embeddings here is that, you know, it's, it's, an oversimpli it's, it's a vast oversimplification. But if you think of these foundation models as just computation graphs, you can actually, you know, a key takeaway here is that, you know, the majority of the compute is happening at the feature extractor piece. And actually, folks are generally, when are doing task specific uh, things, they're generally just changing the last output layer. So if you go back and you actually have this perspective of breaking up the monolith, not thinking of it as, as this one computational block, you see very quickly that, A, all the exact same I.O. and compute is happening up to this point in time. And this is insane because that means I'm doing the same compute like a many number of times, which is very, very expensive. So if you actually just have a, an approach where you actually run your data through the, the foundation models, you cache that, uh, those embeddings, you can now actually serve this to all the tasks. And all of a sudden you can do uh, you can use these foundation models at scale uh, because this ends, up to, this ends up being not only reducing latency and cost, but it unlocks new bandwidth capacity because all of a sudden it doesn't cost a small fortune to run multiple foundation models in parallel. So again, semantics, this is, the, what you can do semantically with embeddings is super powerful, but I want to have a different view here in which you can actually use the embeddings to do AI in a cost-effective fashion. So some parting thoughts uh, that I want to just highlight especially within the context of, uh, of this conference, is I think really we're moving from not no longer data lakes, but to data oceans, because unstructured data is, is huge, right? To give an example to illustrate this, right? Imagine you have tabular data of just 
some bytes, right? 10 million rows of these bytes, uh, 10 million rows of these, say, float 32, so are going to be about 40 megabytes in size. So if we equate that to some sort of area for comparison, let's say that's Lake Tahoe, right? When we jump to text, 10 million documents now jumps through the magnitude and size to about 40 gigabytes. And if we were to compare that to, say, uh, Lake Tahoe, you know, this is now roughly the size of the Caspian Sea. So now we've gone to the largest lake in the world, right? And something to, you know, to kind of preview what we do at Coactive is once you go from text to uh, video, this is, this, you know, you go from, uh, from 40 gigabytes to something in the order of now terabytes. And no longer are you talking about crossing Lake Tahoe, you're talking about crossing the Pacific Ocean. So we need to develop these tools that, hey, not only help us tackle text, but also help us tackle visual data. Not only ha I not only have a few minutes, so I'm just gonna say really quickly, what we do here at Coactive is we unlock the value of image and video data, really focus on essentially a data-centric approach to doing this and bring in really unstructured data to the world of structured data. Something that's exciting, we'd love to talk to you, we'd love to connect, and we are hiring. So if these are kind of the challenges that you'd like to take, uh, you know, feel free to shoot me an email, shoot me a message, or you know, apply on our career stage. Uh, thank you, everyone. Really appreciate your time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Will. Yeah, I can definitely say the Coactive team is, is great. Uh, I'm a big fan of Cody as well. Um, no, thanks. Thanks for that chat. I think we were supposed to meet a while ago, actually, Will, and I, I missed the opportunity. So I'm glad we, we have this chance. Oh, man, Lily, we got to do it after this. Yeah, no, uh, again, a huge thank you to Demetrios, to you, Lily, to the entire MLOS community. This is, this is just an awesome event. I'm super excited to go back and see all the recordings, too. Yeah, definitely. There's some good, good talks lined up. Um, all right. Well, have a wonderful rest of your day. I appreciated the the speedy talking. I was like nervous to give you a <laughs> like. I don't think he can talk any faster. Oh, sorry. This is my 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 hack is my have a timer over here. <laughs> nice, nice. I like it. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks so much.